Hello and welcome everyone to today's webinar, The Processing Rule, A General Overview. My name is Sam Hundley and I am today's moderator. So before we dive in, I do want to point out a couple of features of the webinar environment that we're using today. And so I'm going to switch to the presentation itself. And so here you'll see uh, in the top right, uh, we have files for download, including the slides, which you should have received earlier today, but if you still need a copy, you can download them there, as well as the completion certificate uh, documenting your uh, participation today. And at the bottom of the screen below the slides, you'll see a box marked Q&A. If you have a question, uh, please enter it here. And we encourage you to uh, enter your questions as soon as you have them, just so it's fresh on everyone's mind. So feel free to enter a question at any point today. Um, we won't be taking questions over the phone, but we'll do our best to get through all the questions at uh, end of today's presentation. Um, and you're always welcome to follow up with us via email. Um, and so with that, let's go ahead and get started. So presenting today will be Erica Anthonson and Kylie Larson from the Policy Branch, and Linda Hubeny of the Program Integrity and Monitoring Branch is also in the line to help out with questions. And so with that, I'm going to let them go ahead and take it away. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. This is Erica Anthonson, um, Branch Chief for the Food Distribution Division Policy Branch. So thank you for joining us to learn more about our recently published final rule, revisions and clarifications in requirements for the processing of donated foods, or as it is more commonly referred to, the processing rule. Note that while in the title of the rule and in the regulations the term donated foods is used, donated foods are more commonly referred to as USDA foods. The publication of the final processing rule is an exciting development for the USDA foods processing program. USDA Foods Further Processing allows state distributing agencies and recipient agencies, such as school districts, to contract with commercial food processors to convert raw and or bulk USDA foods into a variety of convenient, ready-to-use end products. Our regulations for the processing program have remained largely unchanged for a number of years. In that time, our on-the-ground practices haven't been static, however. Through demonstration projects, we've tested new ways of doing things in the program. This rule formalizes these processing options in our regulations, establishing them as a permanent part of the program and making the program requirements clearer. At the same time, the final rule also rewrites our processing regulations in a more user-friendly, plain language format. In particular, it rewrites 7 CFR Part 250 Subpart C, where the bulk of our processing pro program requirements are housed. The new rule breaks this subpart into 10 distinct sections. This will make the regulations much easier to read and will make program requirements easier to understand. While the processing rule overhauls our regulations in lots of exciting ways, it is important to note that, the most, that most of the basic requirements for the program aren't changing. Today's webinar is going to focus on the major changes to the regulations to help you understand what the key updates are. We will also touch on some of the key current requirements, but we don't have time to do a comprehensive review of everything in the regulations. If you haven't already, we encourage you to read the rule in its entirety. The preamble of the rule provides a great in-depth discussion of the regulatory changes, and you will find the new regulatory text in its entirety at the end of the rule. One important thing to note is that this rule goes into effect on July 2, 2018, and there may be provisions in the final rule that require you to make changes to the way you operate. We do not expect you to make all of these changes by July 2nd, but we do want you to work to implement any changes as soon as you can. Additionally, some of the new provisions in this rule may need to be implemented sequentially to ensure continuity of the supply chain. Initial steps to implement this rule should be taken as soon as possible, such as beginning to revise state participa participation agreements and negotiating initial agreements between processors and distributors. For many of the major provisions in this rule, we will be issuing additional, gu additional guidance in the coming months that will assist you in making any needed changes. So let's get down to details. As I mentioned, the processing rule incorporates into the regulation several processing options that are being used in current practice through demonstration projects. First, the rule codifies that multi-state processors must enter into national processing agreements and submit end product data schedules to FNS. These requirements were established via demonstration projects in 2001 and expanded in 2005 and 2006 to include all multi-state processors. Second, the rule codifies that multi-state processors must provide a performance bond or irrevocable letter of credit to FNS. These requirements have been in place since 2005. Third, the rule codifies that processors may substitute beef and pork. 
FNS established this flexibility through a demonstration project starting in 1999, and the flexibilities were formalized in policy in 2013. Those updates should be familiar to everyone already, but let's talk about what's new. While most of our processing program requirements are not changing, there are a few significant changes that those participating in the program do need to be aware of. These three new requirements reflect recommendations from program stakeholders with the aim of improving program integrity. First, the final rule requires processors who provide end products containing USDA foods to a distributor to enter into a written agreement with the distributor. The written agreement must include provisions for financial liability for the replacement value of USDA foods, at least monthly end product sales reporting, and which applicable value pass-through system will be used. This was a direct result of an American Commodity Distribution Association recommendation. Second, the final rule requires a title transfer exception dictating that when a recipient agency has contracted with a distributor to act as an authorized agent, title to finished end products containing USDA foods transfers to the recipient agency upon delivery and acceptance by the contracted distributor. And third, the final rule permits processing agreements between state or recipient agencies and processors to be up to five years in duration rather than the current one year. National processing agreements are considered permanent and state participation agreements are allowed to be permanent. With that overview, I'm now going to turn the presentation over to Kylie Larson, who's going to go into more detail on the new regulations. We'll then take some time at the end of today's webinar to answer some of your questions. Um, we definitely encourage you to submit your questions um, as we're going through. As you, as you have them, please go ahead and type them in. We may not be able to answer everything on the call, on the call today, but we'll get to as many as we can. Um, and we certainly appreciate hearing from you on kind of what, what your questions are. So, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Kylie. Thank you, Erica. While the bulk of the regulatory changes made by the new rule were to subpart C of Part 250, the rule does make changes to a few other sections of the regulations. Among them, it adds regulatory definitions to 250.2 for a number of important processing terms. The terms newly incorporated into Part 250 are listed here. These terms are not new to the program. They've been in use for a while and should be familiar to you already. There were also two definitions that were removed, contracting agency and fee for service. The term contracting agency was replaced throughout the regulation with more specific terminology, i.e. distributing and or recipient agency. The meaning of the term fee for service is clear in the context of the new regulatory provisions and no longer requires a separate definition. One of the most important changes we are making in this rule is to section 250.11, which covers delivery and receipt of USDA food shipments. The change is specifically to 250.11e, which describes when title to USDA foods transfers from USDA to a distributing or recipient agency. The big change we are making to this section is that when a distributor is acting as a recipient agency's authorized agent, the transfer of title from USDA to recipient agency occurs upon delivery to the distributor. Under our prior rules, title did not transfer to the recipient agency until it was delivered to the school. Many recipient agencies receiving finished end products from multi-state processors contract with a distributor to store end products and or transport the finished end products to their facilities. In these cases, the title of USDA foods would transfer to the recipient agency upon acceptance of finished end products at the time and place of delivery at the recipient agency or the distributor acting as the authorized agent of the recipient agency, whichever happens first. In other words, title of USDA foods transfers from USDA to a recipient agency, which is typically a school, when the processor delivers the end products to a recipient agency or to a distributor of the recipient agency's choice. The main reason we are making this change is to address challenges related to the tracking and reporting of value of USDA foods when distributors are included in the supply chain for finished end products. 
Because processors are not a part of the contractual relationship between recipient agencies and distributors, processors lose control of finished end products once they are delivered to the distributors. At the same time, processors were required to maintain a bond for the value of USDA foods at distributors. In situations where recipient agencies contract with a distributor to store and or transport processed end products containing USDA foods and act as their authorized agent, complications can arise that may impede the smooth transfer of title. Some processors and distributors manufacture and or order some processed end products containing USDA foods prior to receiving orders from recipient agencies. This is sometimes called inventory pooling. This is most commonly due to a processor's and or distributor's manufacturing or ordering end products in advance of receiving orders from recipient agencies based on forecasted estimates. Under previous regulations, title could not transfer to the recipient agency at the time of delivery at its contracted distributor because neither the processor nor the distributor knew which recipient agency would receive which products. We are trying to establish more transparency and accountability in the supply chain. We want to make sure that we can track whose inventory is where. The intent of this new requirement is to discourage the pooling of processed end products at distributors. This may change the timing of end product orders placed by recipient agencies and distributors and may lend itself to modified contractual arrangements between recipient agencies and distributors. Practically speaking, a distributor acting as an authorized agent of a recipient agency will now be required to know which recipient agency will be receiving what before they order anything from the processor. Recipient agencies may have to be more proactive with their ordering to ensure that they receive their M products in a timely manner. Alternatively, recipient agencies may need to alter their contractual relationship with their distributor to allow the distributor to order products on their behalf and deliver them when needed. In these cases, recipient agencies will need to diligently track their USDA foods to ensure that they receive their full value of USDA donated foods. This change will permit processors to draw down recipient agencies' inventory on their monthly performance reports once the products are delivered and accepted at the distributor acting as the recipient agency's agent. We have heard questions on whether this new provision will require distributors to maintain separate school-owned inventories for each recipient agency, including individual stockkeeping units for each end product and recipient agency. This is not the case. FNS does not expect distributors to maintain separate physical inventories for every recipient agency. This would be overly burdensome and would contradict the long-established concept of substitution in USDA foods processing. As Erica previously mentioned, this rule goes into effect on July 2nd of 2018. This provision may require you to make changes to the way you operate. We do not expect you to make all of these changes by July 2nd, but we do want you to work to implement any changes as soon as you can. We understand that there may be a need for further guidance on this provision of the new regulations, and we will be exploring what guidance is needed over the next few months. Now that we've covered program definitions and 250.11e, we're going to move on to subpart C the processing of donated food section of Part 250. As we noted earlier, this section is being overhauled entirely. Under our prior regulatory structure, all of the content in this subpart was organized within just one section, 250.30. This made the regulations hard to read and reference. We're going to briefly walk through each of the new sections. 
will go very quickly through most and focus mainly on the areas where there are changes you need to be aware of. Keep in mind that while this section has been rewritten, most of the underlying requirements are not changing. For the most part, the regulations are being rewritten in plain language or we are formalizing processing options that have been implemented via demonstration projects. The first section of our restructured subpart C, 250.30, lays out some of the basics of the processing program. Among the policies covered in this section, 250.30 describes the purpose of the processing of USDA foods, establishes requirements for processing agreements and describes types permitted, sets the allowable duration of agreements, lists the criteria state distributing agencies must use to select processors, requires distributing agencies to ensure the acceptability of end products through product testing, and includes the prohibition on subcontracting without the specific written consent of the other party to the agreement, i.e. the distributing or recipient agency or FNS as appropriate. Most of what's covered in 250.30 is not new, but there are several changes that are worth highlighting. First, this section codifies the types of processing agreements that are available. These agreements have been in use for several years. We are updating and clarifying the language in the regulations around agreements. Many of the requirements for processing agreements are already found in regulation, but the language used to describe the agreements is outdated. The terminology used for agreements in the old regulations was contracts, which caused some confusion. The new regulations clarify that agreements are separate documents from the competitively procured contracts discussed later in 250.31. 250.30 clarifies that the processing of USDA foods must be done in accordance with a processing agreement and that processing agreements are required in addition to, not in lieu of, the competitively procured contracts required in the new 250.31. These agreements are required to ensure that all federal and state processing requirements are followed and competitively procured contracts are required to ensure that full and open competition takes place in accordance with federal, state, and local procurement rules. In addition to these clarifications, we made some changes to the duration of agreements. Under our old rules, processing agreements were limited to one year with the option to extend for two additional one-year periods. The final, final rule revised this requirement by permitting all agreements between a distributing, subdistributing, or recipient agency and a processor to be up to five years in duration. Our intention was to permit the appropriate agency to determine the length of agreement that would be to its best advantage and to reduce time and labor burdens. The final rule makes national processing agreements permanent and permits states to make state participation agreements permanent as well with amendments to be made as needed, for example, when new subcontractors are added. <clears throat> there are two other updates in 250.30 that we want to mention. First, in 250.30a, we clarify that a processor's use of a commercial facility to repackage USDA foods or to use USDA foods in the preparation of meals is considered processing. Meal vendors have long been considered processors under current regulations, and this, pro this provision clarifies that established requirement. Second, the new rule also added a requirement for agreements between processors and distributors. The agreement must contain the financial liability for the replacement value of USDA foods, not less than monthly end product sales reporting frequency, requirements under 250.11e, 
and the applicable value pass-through system to ensure that the value of USDA foods and finished end products are properly credited to recipient agencies. Distributing agencies can also set additional requirements for these agreements. Verification of the agreements between processors and distributors will be required as part of the third-party audits that processors must obtain. The length of the agreement is determined by the parties to the agreement, i.e., the distributor and the processor. Now we're going to take a quick break for a polling question, so I'm going to hand it back to Sam. Thanks, Charlie. All right, so for the polling question, we're actually going to have two different questions, uh, one for school districts and one for processors. So for school districts, how do you receive processed in products? Uh, through a state procured contract, a co-op procured, procured contract, a recipient agency procured contract direct from the processor, or a recipient agency procured contract, uh, let me pull this further down, through the distributor. And for processors, how many states um, do you have a state participation agreement with? All right, and we'll give you a couple of seconds to uh, finish answering. All right, so we'll start with the schools. So it looks like um, we have, let's see here, broadcast results. Uh, the majority of people have, uh, say that they work through co-op for geared contracts, um, but then we have uh, that's followed quickly by recipient agency procured uh, contract through a distributor. All right, and so for the processors, it looks like the majority of our participants um, have 25 or more uh, state participation agreements with different states. Um, and then that's uh, followed pretty closely by 5 to 15 uh, and 15 to 25. And it looks like we have a good number of in-state processors uh, only. So thank you, everyone, for taking time to respond. Uh, and I'm going to hand it back over to Kylie. Thanks, Sam. 250.31 is a short section with just two subparagraphs, but they're very important. It covers the basic procurement requirements that apply to procurements for processed end products. 250.31a establishes that distributing or recipient agencies may use procurement procedures that conform to applicable state and local laws, but must ensure compliance with federal procurement requirements. This is not a change from current rules. 250.31b lays out the minimum information that must be included in procurement contracts and solicitations for processed end products containing USDA foods. Our goal here is to ensure that federal rules requiring full and open competition are followed and to assist recipient agencies in ensuring that they receive credit for, for the value of USDA foods in finished end products. To that end, we are requiring that all procurement documents include the following information. The price to be charged for the end product or other processing service, the method of end product sales that will be utilized and assurance that crediting for USDA foods will be performed in accordance with the applicable requirements for such methods of sales, which will be discussed later in 250.36, the value of the USDA foods in the end products, and the location for the delivery of the end products. This provision applies to all procurements for end products containing USDA foods, regardless of who performs the procurement. This is a new requirement in the program regulations, but the list of required items should not be a change in principle, as these are all important and basic pieces of information for contracts and solicitations. As we discussed earlier in this presentation, under our old regulations, we did not sufficiently distinguish between the requirements for agreements and the requirements for procurement documents. In fact, the terminology used for agreements in the old regulations was contracts, 
which certainly caused some confusion. Our updated regulations clearly distinguish between the requirements for agreements, which are laid out in 250.30 and 250.38, and the requirements for procurement documents laid out here and in federal procurement rules. 250.32 goes over the requirements for bonds and letters of credit. 250.32a requires multi-state processors to provide a performance bond or irrevocable letter of credit to FNS in accordance with their national processing agreements to protect the value of USDA foods in processor inventories. This was already a requirement, but we made the following updates. Because escrow accounts were rarely used, we removed this as an option for financial protection. We also codified in the regulations that multi-state processors must provide a performance bond or letter of credit to FNS. Program policy states that the amount of bond protection must be sufficient to cover at least 75% of the value of USDA foods in the processor's physical or book inventory as determined annually, and the multi-state processors in their first year of participation in the processing program must hold a performance bond or letter of credit for 100% of the value of USDA foods. <coughs> Note, that while these bond requirements are new to the regulations, they are not new requirements. They have been in place under the National Processing Agreement for a number of years. In 250.32b describes when distributing and recipient agencies must call in performance bonds or letters of credit under in-state and recipient agency processing agreements. This section also establishes that FNS will call in performance bonds or letters of credit under the same conditions and will ensure that any monies recovered by FNS are reimbursed to distributing agencies for losses of USDA food. In 250.33, we lay out requirements related to processing yields of USDA foods and end product data schedules, or EPDS. In 250.33a, we require submission of all currently required information on the end product data schedule with one exception. We have removed the requirement to include pricing information on the EPDS. As we mentioned when discussing 250.31, pricing information must now be included in procurement contracts for processed end products or services. Inclusion of such information on end product data schedules may be misleading as it may lead some recipient agencies to erroneously conclude that a competitive procurement has been performed by the distributing agency. In 250.33a, we also require inclusion of the processing yield of USDA food, which may be expressed as the quantity of USDA food needed to produce a specific quantity of end product or as the percentage of USDA food returned in the finished end product. Lastly, we clarify that an end product data schedule must be submitted in a standard electronic format dictated by FNS and approved for each new end product that a processor wishes to provide or for a previously approved end product in which the ingredients or other pertinent information has been altered. In 250.33b, we describe the different processing yields of USDA foods that may be approved in end product data schedules. In an effort to simplify the yield requirements and streamline monitoring for distributing and recipient agencies, we limited the processing yields to 100% yield, guaranteed yield, and standard yield. Guaranteed minimum yield is no longer a yield option. In 250.33c, we require that the processor compensate the distributing or recipient agency as appropriate for the loss of USDA foods or for commercially purchased foods substituted for USDA foods. Loss of USDA foods may result for a number of reasons. 
including the processor's fail failure to meet the required processing yield or failure to produce end products that meet required specifications, spoilage or damage of USDA foods, or improper distribution of end products. In order to compensate for such losses of USDA foods, we require that the processor take one of the following actions. Replace the lost USDA food or commercial substitute with commercially purchased food of the same generic identity of U.S. origin and equal or better in all USDA procurement specifications than the USDA food. Return end products that are wholesome but do not meet required specifications to production or processing into the requisite quantity of end products that meet the required specifications or pay the distributing or recipient agency as appropriate for the replacement value of the USDA food or commercial substitute only if the purchase of replacement foods is not feasible and the processor has received approval. In-state processors are required to obtain distributing agency approval for such payments and multi-state processors are required to obtain FNS approval. In 250.33D, we require that credit for the sale of any byproduct resulting from the processing of USDA foods or of commercially purchased foods substituted for USDA foods be done through invoice reductions or another means of crediting. We also clarify that the processor must credit the appropriate agency for the net value received from the sale of byproducts after subtraction of any documented expenses incurred in preparing the byproduct for sale. We removed the requirement in prior regulations that the processor credit the distributing or recipient agency for the sale of USDA food containers because the burden required to monitor the credit outweighed the value returned. 250.34 describes when and how commercially purchased foods can be substituted for USDA foods. In 250.34a, we permit a processor to substitute any USDA food that is delivered to it from a USDA vendor with commercially purchased food of the same generic identity of US origin and of equal or better quality in all departmental purchase specifications than the USDA food, including but not limited to inspection, grading, testing, and humane handling standards. Substitutions must be approved by the department in advance and in accordance with their substitution plan. We removed the required elements of a processor's plan for poultry substitution. We also allow a processor to substitute any USDA food in advance of receipt of the USDA food shipments, and we more clearly describe the processor's assumption of risk should the department be unable to purchase and deliver any USDA food that's substituted. <laughs> Lastly, we require that commercially purchased food substituted for USDA food meet the same processing yield requirements that would be required for the USDA food as we discuss in the revised 250.33. 250.34b prohibits substitution of backhauled USDA foods and addresses requirements for backhauled USDA foods. USDA food may be backhauled to a processor from a distributing or recipient agency facility to process into a more usable form. In the revised 250.34b, we prohibit substitution or commingling of all backhauled USDA foods and require that the processor process such end products for sale and delivery to the same recipient agency that provided them and not to any other recipient agency. In other words, the distributing or recipient agency which backhauls product to a processor must in turn use the end products containing their backhauled product in their food service. 
Additionally, we prohibit the processor from providing payment to the recipient agency in lieu of processing and prohibit the distributing or recipient agency from transferring the backhauled food to another processor. 250.34C and D cover grading requirements and when they can be waived. Under prior regulations, the distributing agency was permitted to approve a waiver of the grading requirement for beef, pork, or poultry under certain conditions. We include this contingency in the revised regulations and retain the conditions under which the distributing agency may approve such a waiver in 250.34D. However, we indicate that such waivers are only to be approved on a case-by-case -case basis, for example, for a, for a specific production run. In other words, the distributing agency may not approve a blanket waiver of the requirement. We also include the previous stipulation that a waiver may only be approved if the processor's past performance indicates that the quality of the end product would not be adversely affected. In 250.35, we include requirements for the storage, food safety oversight, quality control, and inventory management of USDA foods provided for processing. In this section, we removed the requirement that exterior shipping containers or product labels for end products containing non-substitutable USDA foods include such information to ensure their sale to eligible recipient agencies. Such assurance may be made through notification to the appropriate parties or by other means. We also allow FNS to sweep inventories deemed excessive. FNS can require an inventory transfer to another state distributing agency or processor when inventories are determined to be excessive for a state distributing agency or processor, i.e. more than six months of on-hand inventory, or exceeding the established inventory protection to ensure full utilization prior to the end of the school year. In 250.35E, we clarify that the distributing agency may permit the processor to carry over USDA foods in excess of allowed levels into the next year of its agreement if the distributing agency determines that the processor may efficiently process such foods. This carryover would be in lieu of the last resort of requiring the processor to pay the distributing agency for the replacement value of USDA foods held in excess of allowable inventory levels at the end of the year. We also include here the distributing agency's option to direct the processor to transfer or re-donate such USDA foods to another distributing or recipient agency or processor. Lastly, in 250.35F, we expand the previous options for the disposition of substitutable USDA foods at the termination of an agreement to include all donated foods in accordance with the revised 250.34, which permits the substitution of all USDA foods. We clarify that the disposition of USDA foods may include a return or transfer, i.e. the distributing agency may permit the return or transfer of USDA foods or commercially purchased foods that meet the substitution requirements in 250.34. If at the termination of an agreement, these options are not practical, the processor may, with FNS approval, pay the distributing or recipient agency as appropriate for the donated foods at the contract value or replacement value of donated foods, whichever is higher. And now we are going to take another short break for a polling question, so I'll hand it back to Sam. Thanks, Carly. All right, so this question is for everyone. Which value pass-through system do you use most frequently? Do you use refund uh, or rebate, direct discount, indirect discount, also known as NOI, uh, fee-for-service, some approved alternative method, or you don't know.
All right, thank you, everyone. And it looks like NOI I has won by a landslide here uh, with 226 people saying that that's what they use most. Uh, and that's followed by fee for service. And um, I think that's about it. All right, great. Thank you very much. And I'm going to hand it back over to Kylie. Thanks, Sam. In 250.36, we describe the methods of end product sales. A processor must sell end products to recipient agencies under a system that ensures such agencies receive credit or value pass-through for the contract value of USDA foods contained in the end product. For easy reference, we've listed the new citations for each of the value pass-through systems here. More specifically, in 250.36e, we expanded the provision on fee-for-service to identify three distinct variations. In 250.36h, we require that the distributing agency provide the processor with a list of recipient agencies elig eligible to purchase end products along with the quantity of raw USDA food that is to be delivered to the processor for processing on behalf of each recipient agency. This is intended to ensure that only eligible recipient agencies receive end products and that those end products are received only in the amounts for which they are eligible. For end products sold through distributors, we require that the processor provide the distributor with a list of eligible recipient agencies and either the quantities of approved end products that each recipient agency is eligible to receive or the quantity of USDA food allocated to each recipient agency along with the raw USDA food needed per case of each approved end product. Lastly, we removed the requirement under the old regulations that the distributor apply to the processor for a refund under the indirect discount system. In 250.37, we include the reporting and record keeping requirements for the processing of USDA foods and the use of such reports and records to review processor performance. In 250.37a, we removed the additional month previously allotted for reporting year-end transactions. The advanced tracking methods instituted with improved technology permits processors to complete the necessary tasks without additional time. This will assist state agencies in expediting the analysis of processor inventory. In 250.37b, we permit processors to report reductions in donated food inventories on performance reports upon delivery and acceptance at the, of the end product by a distributor acting as an authorized agent of a, of a distributing or recipient agency. In 250.38, we include the required provisions for each type of processing agreement to ensure compliance with the requirements in 7 CFR Part 250. This section codified the provisions of agreements in accordance with existing program policy. The required provisions of agreements are not changing very much, but we did make some updates. For state participation and in-state processing agreements, we added a statement requiring the processor to enter into an agreement with distributors. We added a provision that distributing and or recipient agencies may choose to terminate processor agreements if they do not comply with other requirements but we allow distributing and recipient agencies discretion in determining whether or not to extend or renew agreements when a processor has not complied with processing requirements. However, these decisions will be evaluated by FNS during reviews of distributing and recipient agencies to ensure compliance with processing requirements. These new requirements of agreements take effect as of July 2nd. So you should work to update your agreements with these new provisions as soon as possible. That brings us to the final section of the rule, 
250.39, which covers miscellaneous provisions that do not fit elsewhere in the rule. This section includes FNS waiver authority, a requirement that distributing agencies develop a processing manual or other guidance on processing requirements, and it references the FNS website. In 250.39b, we retained the previous requirement that the distributing agency develop and provide a processing manual or other guidance on processing requirements to processors and other parties and we permit distributing agencies to provide additional information relating to state-specific processing requirements upon request. In 250.39c, we clarified that guidance or information relating to the processing of USDA foods is included on the FNS website or may otherwise be obtained from FNS. Such guidance and information includes program regulations and policies, the FNS Audit Guide, and the USDA National Processing Agreement. Now before we conclude, we're going to do one more polling question. All right, so for this question, you can select multiple answers, and we want to know what is your source for learning about policy changes from FNS? From your state, from your FNS regional office, from the FNS national office, from my processor or distributor, from my school district, or from the FNS website? And remember, you can select multiple options if you would like. Thanks, Sam. So let's go ahead and uh, look through the answers. And it looks like we have uh, people are using a variety of sources. A lot of people are listening to their state, to the national office, uh, using the FNS website. So this is good that you're using a variety of approaches. So I want to hand it back over to Kylie. Great. In the coming months, we will be providing additional guidance on some areas of the new regulation. We received several requests for further guidance or clarification on some topics in the new rule. We will be exploring further guidance, whether further guidance is necessary, and we'll be working to assist all of our program stakeholders with implementation of the new regulation. In addition to the revised regulatory text, we encourage you to consult the following resources for further information regarding the regulatory changes. Thank you, Kylie. Um, with that, we're going to spend a little time answering questions today. So we will try to work through some of the questions that were sent in ahead of time, as well as some of the questions that we've received today. Um, so, and if you still have questions, you still have time to send those in. So feel free to add any questions you have to the Q&A box. As I mentioned earlier, uh, we're going to try to answer as many questions as we can. Um, we may not be able to answer every question on the line today, but if there's any questions that we don't get to, we're definitely going to make a note of them and we will they will certainly inform um, additional guidance and additional information that we put out on the rule. So with that, I guess I'll get started with some questions. So Kylie and Linda are going to be helping us answer today. Oh, and before we go, I think Sam has some information about some of your wrap-up questions for you to answer. Yeah, just real quick, um, while we're doing the questions, uh, if you could take the time to fill out the survey questions that I just posted, I would greatly appreciate it. This is also a good place to add additional feedback on the webinar itself and ways we can improve. Um, but as Erica mentioned, uh, you can respond, uh, provide further questions in the Q&A box that's still at the bottom of the screen. Thanks, Erica. All right. Thank you, Sam. With that, I'm going to do a, uh, turn to our first question. 
Um, and I think, Kylie, would you like to answer the first question today? Sure. So for our first question, if a processor works with many different distributors, will they need to complete a separate agreement with each distributor? Yes. However, the processor's option, they could establish a template and or standard agreement to be signed by each distributor. Great. Thank you, Kylie. Um, moving on, so let's see, another question we have, and, and Linda, perhaps we'll turn to you to answer our next question. If there are currently agreements in place, such as agreements between a processor and distributor that address the topics specified in the final rule, is there anything else that needs to be done? Linda, can you take that one? Sure. So if agreements currently in place fully address the required topics in, the, in this rule, then no further action is necessary. However, all current agreements should be evaluated to ensure that they fully adhere to the requirements in this rule. Thank you, Linda. Let's see, another question we have. The state distributing agencies have to conduct a competitive procurement when selecting processors with which to sign a state participation agreement or in-state processing agreement. Linda, could you cover that one for us as well? Sure. No, as long as the agreement only establishes the processor's eligibility to operate within the state and the state is not procuring end products on behalf of the recipient agencies, the state doesn't need to conduct a competitive comp procurement. However, recipient agencies must conduct a competitive procurement in accordance with federal procurement rules. The, section, the selection criteria at 250.30D and E are intended as holistic metrics upon which states can assess the suitability of a processor to operate within their state. Thank you so much, Linda. Okay, another question we've received is a request for us to provide clarification on pooling and bonding for commercial distributors. Kylie, can I turn to you for that one? Sure. Uh, we discussed inventory pooling earlier on in this presentation, and we hopefully provided some clarification there. We do want to clarify that we do not require distributors to have bonds. This is just a requirement for processors. Okay. Thank you, Kylie. Let's see. Um, kind of going through some of the questions. Another one we've received is, please confirm net off invoice rebates through distributor requires distribu distributor agreement. Kylie, can you take that one as well? Yes. Um, processors must have agreements with distributors for all value pass-through methods. Okay. Thank you, Kylie. Um, let's see. Another question we've received, and Linda, I think we'll turn to you to this for this one. Is the prohibition on substitution of backhaul USDA foods intended to discourage backhauling? Sure. So in revised 250.34b, we prohibit substitution or commingling of all backhaul USDA foods and require end products produced from backhaul foods be sold and delivered to the, recipient, the agency that provided the food and not to any other agency. Situations may arise where backhauling USDA foods for further processing may be a viable option for the recipient agency. However, backhauling of USDA foods to processors has always presented unique food safety concerns, potential for temperature abuse and mishandling, and it is an inefficient use of transportation resources. Thank you, Linda. That's very helpful clarification. All right, another question we've received. How long will distributor and processor agreements be effective? Do we have to do a new one every year? I'll turn to Kylie for this one. Sure. Uh, the agreements between processors and distributors can be of any length. The two parties to the agreement can decide how long they'd like the agreement to last. Additionally, <clears throat> state agencies could include provisions uh, that they want to add to those agreements as part of their state participation agreement with processors. Great. Right, thank you for that clarification. Let's see, another question we've received. Are U.S. soybeans available for further processing into USDA foods? Kylie, can I let you answer that one as well? Sure. Uh, no, U.S. soybeans are not currently available for further processing into USDA foods. Okay. Um, let's see, another question we've received. Where can we access the FNS-approved EPDSs, and will they be used for beef, pork, and poultry items. Kylie? Uh, sure. 
Uh, end product data schedules for all products are proprietary information owned by each individual processor. So end product data schedules are not publicly available. Okay, thank you, Kylie. Let's see, moving on to another question we've received. Does it matter whether the processor or distributor executes the agreement? Kylie, can you answer that one as well? Sure. Uh, no, it, it doesn't matter who initiates this agreement. Uh, we intended for processors and distributors to discuss what provisions they would like in these agreements. And so it should be more or less a collaborative discussion to establish these agreements. But it doesn't, doesn't matter who initiates really, as long as the agreements are in place. Okay. All right. Thank you. And, you know, just a reminder, folks, do you have more questions, you still can enter them into the Q&A box, but we'll continue to kind of work through um, some of the ones we received. Um, Linda, I think we'll come back to you for the next one. Do distributing agencies need to review specific plans for product promotion or sales expansion for processors reporting no sales activity during the prior year's contract period prior to submitting food requisitions for that processor? Linda, can you answer that for us? Sure. Yes. However, this requirement at 250.35D applies to existing processors that have reported no sales activity in the prior year's contract period, and it does not apply to new processors. New processors are evaluated according to 250.30 prior to signing a processing agreement with the state. Okay, hey, thank you, Linda. Let's see. Um, continuing on, another one for you, Linda. How is the six-month inventory limit to be calculated? So the six-month inventory limit requirement in 250.35D is based on the average amount of donated foods utilized. A step-by-step -step calculation is provided in Policy Memorandum FD064. Based on comments received during the public comment period, FNS is exploring changes to FD064. Thank you, Linda. All right, so while they're answering more questions and uh, your questions are coming in, uh, thank you very much for your participation. We really appreciate everyone being so engaged. Um, but I just want to take a moment to plug our uh, monthly e-letter. Um, if you didn't know about it, uh, USDA uh, has a monthly e-letter about specifically USDA foods. We have uh, a general e-letter about all of our programs, but then we also have specific ones for the schools, for the household programs, for FDPIR. If you're interested in uh, signing up, you can do so by copying and pasting the blue text in the interested in our e-letter text box on the right-hand side of your screen, um, and you can sign up there. And this is also a location where you can sign up to receive notifications about upcoming webinars that might be relevant to your interest. Uh, so we highly suggest that you check this out. And so I'm going to hand it back over to the webinar team. Thank you, Sam, for that um, update. Okay, another question we've received, and Kylie, this one will be for you. Do we need a processing agreement if all of our processed items come through a distributor? Sure, so this is another example of where we're trying to clarify the difference between agreements and contracts. Any processor working with a distributor needs to have an agreement in place with that distributor, as we discussed in the rule. However, all processors need to have a processing agreement in place, whether that's a national processing agreement with a state participation agreement attached to it, or an in-state processing agreement or recipient agency processing agreement but those are only available for in-state processors. The processing agreement needs to be in place to allow the processor to receive USDA foods, but it does not guarantee that that processor will be able to sell any of the products. Those products need to be competitively procured in the form of a solicitation and a contract. Okay, thank you, Kylie. Um, Linda, we'll come back to you for the next one. Um, so for another question we've gotten, does the transfer and inventory pooling rule apply just to processed end products or to del direct delivery commodities as well? Linda? So for all USDA foods titled to donated food transfers to the distributing agency or recipient agency as appropriate under upon acceptance of the donated foods at the time and place of delivery. Inventory pooling is specifically an issue found with the processing of USDA foods and the interactions between processors and distributors. 
The new pro this new provision, which includes the exception that when a recipient agency has contracted with a distributor to act as their authorized agent, title to finished end products containing donated foods transfers to the recipient agency upon delivery and acceptance by the contracted distributor. This, ex this exception is specific to processed end products. Thank you, Linda. Another question for Kylie. Do currently approved end product data schedules, EPDSs, need to be revised? Uh, the answer to that is no. Um, end product data schedules have always and will always need to be revised if any of the information on the end product data schedule, such as uh, a reformulation of a product, changes, but currently approved end product data schedules can remain in effect. Okay. Thank you, Kylie. Another question for Kylie. Oh, hold on one second while I find the... Will a distributor be required to have a national processing agreement when acting on behalf of a recipient agency? Uh, the answer to that question is no. National processing agreements are agreements signed between national processors or multi-state processors and FNS. Only processors are subject to these agreements because it gives them the ability to receive USDA foods. However, a distributor will always need to have a competitively procured contract with a recipient agency. Okay, thank you, Kylie. We'll go back to Linda for our next question. A vendor is using USDA foods in unitized meals currently being sold to recipient agencies as a meal pattern compliant meal. Is this vendor considered a processor, food service management company, or a vendor of vended meals? Linda, would you mind taking that question? Sure. <clears throat> Any private entity utilizing USDA foods at a commercial facility is considered a processor and is subject to the requirements of 7 CFR Part 250. Although the processing rule clarified this requirement, it is not new under our program rules. Vended meal company is not a regulatory term. Thanks, Linda. And another related question. If a vendor of unitized meals using USDA foods in prepared meals is considered a processor, will that vendor have to meet the processing requirements and have a state processing agreement? Linda, would you mind answering that one as well? Sure. Yes. Any private entity utilizing USDA foods at a commercial facility is considered a processor and is subject to the requirements of 7 CFR two part, part 250. This includes the requirement to have either a valid national processing agreement and a state participation agreement in each state in which they operate or a valid state processing agreement if they meet the regulatory definition of an in-state processor. This is not a change to the current rules. Thank you, Linda. So, Kylie, we'll come back to you for our next question. If a distributor who only utilizes net off invoice as a value pass Oh, sorry, is a distributor who only utilizes net off invoice as a value pass through system require a bond? Um, so the answer to that question is that distributors are not required to have bonds under the processing regulations. Only processors of USDA foods are required to have bonds. Okay. Thank you. And so another question for you, Kylie. Currently, how many processes are actor are active or used? as an average? Uh, currently, we have about 80 national processors with valid not national processing agreements. Okay. Great. Um, let's see. So another question, will there be a template created for a processor distributed agreement format? Good question. Uh, yes. Um, so there is currently a template on the ACTA website. Um, also, several states prior to the publication of this final rule required agreements between processors and distributors. So in addition to the ACTA template, there are uh, other examples out there in states where these agreements have been required for some time. Okay, thank you. Um, another question for you, Kylie. If a processor of USDA foods currently only has a state agreement with the new rule, does this processor need to, be a need to have a national agreement in place? Okay, so there are essentially two types of processors in USDA foods processing. There are in-state processors and multi-state processors. An in-state processor is a processor 
who only sells end products in one state and has their manufacturing facilities also in that same state. So those in-state processors can operate using only an in-state processing agreement or a recipient agency processing agreement if authorized by the distributing agency. In those situations, the state distributing agency is required to ensure that the requirements of 7 CFR Part 250 are met, such as the bonding requirements. However, multi-state processors operate in more than one state and or have their manufacturing facilities in multiple or separate states from where they do their business. So those processors must have a national processing agreement executed with FNS as well as a state participation agreement in each state in which they operate to ensure that state-specific rules are also included. Thank you, Kylie. Um, with that, I think Linda will come back to you for to answer the next one. Does a processor need to have processing agreements in place before they can be contracted by a school food authority? So not necessarily. Processors must have the required processing agreements in place before they can receive USDA foods for processing. Typically, a processor would sign a processing agreement with the relevant agencies and would then competitively um, contract, but would then be competitive competitively contracted by an SFA. However, some states allow SFAs to competitively procure contracts with processors before the processing agreement's in place. A processor must have the required agreements in place and have competitively procure, procured contracts with the recipient agency before they can process or deliver any end products. Great. Thank you, Linda. Kylie, we'll come back to you for the next one. Um, this is a, a, looks like a, related to one of the questions we answered earlier. Where can you find the template for the EPDS? Uh, a template end product data schedule is found on the USDA Processors Partner webpage. Uh, let's see, another question. When will the revised national processing agreement to account be, when, when will we be revising the national processing agreement to account for the new regulations? We're currently working to revise the National Processing Agreement to include all of the changes made in this final rule. We're hoping that this revised National Processing Agreement will be out soon. And once it is out, we will execute new agreements with national processors, and those agreements will be permanent. Great. Thank you, Kylie. Linda, we'll come back to you for the next question, if you don't mind. Can you provide an example of a backhauled USDA food product being delivered to a processor for reprocessing? Sure. So perhaps a, a recipient agency has bulk chicken processed into chicken nuggets and wings and then decides to have those products backhauled to have a variety of season, seasonings applied to the chicken products for use in their meal service. Another example is having meat patties made with bulk beef and then having the patties backhauled to add cheese and, and a bun. Thank you, Linda. Um, let's see, another question for you, Linda. If WebSDM is rolled down to the recipient agency, does the state need to provide a list of recipient agencies eligible to purchase end products in 250.36H since processors can access this information directly in WebSDM? So in states that have um, web supply rolled down to the recipient agencies. Processors can access the requisition status report, which re, uh, provides the required information. States can choose how they prefer to convey the required information in 7 CFR 250.36H. Processors must also provide this information to distributors to ensure distributors sell end products only to the eligible recipient agencies. Thank you, Linda. Kylie, we'll come back to you for our next question. Our state just updated school year 18 to 22 SPAs using the prototype. Will we have to, to update with additional language? So the answer to that question uh, was touched on earlier in the presentation. This final rule goes into effect on July 2nd of this year. However, we realize that it takes some time to update all of these agreements. What we recommend is that states 
recipient agencies, as well as us at FNS, evaluate all of the agreements that we have in place in the context of the new rule to determine if they are in compliance. It is possible that some agreements are already in compliance with this new rule, depending on what state, state requirements exist. So we recommend that you evaluate your agreements and make changes as soon as you can. Okay, thank you, Kylie. Linda, coming back to you, another question. Will the USDA or state distributing agencies be responsible for verifying slash collecting processor distributor agreements? So the agreements between the processors and the distributors will be verified during the third-party processor audits. States can require verification of these agreements as part of their state participation agreement. And as previous, previously mentioned, states can require provisions to the agreements between the processor and the distributors. Thanks, Linda. Let's see, another question for you, Kylie. Um, we're good. The question: Will current processors need to sign the new national processing agreement? Uh, yes. When the national processing agreement is revised by FNS, all current multi-state or national processors will need to sign revised national processing agreements. Okay. Thank you. Um, another question for you, Kylie: Can a state disallow a processor to process in their state? So, as we mentioned in the presentation, there are uh, criteria, selection criteria that a state needs to use to evaluate uh, whether or not a processor is a good fit for their state. Um, those requirements are at 250.30D and E. Um, these metrics are intended as uh, holistic measures to assess the suitability of a processor to operate within their state. So based on these criteria, if a state feels that a processor is not a good or is not suitable within their state, they could choose to not sign a state participation agreement with that processor. That being said, any, any decision to not sign a state participation agreement with a processor based on those criteria will be evaluated during the state's next management evaluation, and they will need to justify that decision based on the criteria at 250.30D and E. Okay, thank you, Kylie. Linda, another question for you. Who will monitor that processors have contracts that meet requirements? So contractors and uh, contracts and other procurement documents between processors and recipient agencies will be reviewed as part of the third-party audit on the processor side, as well as the procurement review component of the administrative review on the recipient agency side. Great, thank you, Linda. Kylie, we'll come back to you again. Uh, the question reads, I found different processor and distributor, distributor agreement templates based on the value pass-through method, uh, so for example, fee-for-service and net-off invoice. What if both methods apply to the same distributor? Do we need both for the same distributor? Um, so that's a good question. There are certainly scenarios where distributors will sell end products to recipient agencies using different value pass-through systems to account for the preferences of those recipient agencies. Since these agreements between processors and distributors, other than the specific points we laid out in the regulation, are largely up to the processors and distributors, they can choose to have separate agreements for separate value pass-through systems, or they can choose to have a joint agreement that covers all of those value pass-through systems. The important thing is that the, uh, the criteria within those agreements meet what we put in the new regulation as far as the liability for USDA foods and title transfer. Thank you, Kylie. Linda, turning to you again, does discouraging pooled inventory affect all states? I believe in my state, end products are assigned to specific recipient agencies when they arrive at distributors. Are processors doing this behind the scenes? So in, in inventory pooling is not practiced by all distributors and is not present in every state. Some states closely manage the end products and require that the end products are assigned to a specific recipient agency when they arrive at the distributor. Thank you, Linda. 
another question for Kylie. What about the audit guide? When, will, when can we see that updated? So the audit guide is in the process of being updated by FNS. However, I will say that the government-wide auditing standards, or the document that the audit guide is based on, is currently being revised by a, a different federal department. So we are waiting until the revised government-wide audit standards are revised before we revise and publish the, re the new audit guide. Thank you, Kyle. And I think Sam will jump in with an update from his end. Yeah, just as an update, because I've seen a few people asking about it, uh, but we have been recording this webinar, and it will be available uh, for uh, viewing afterwards. We'll send out a notification once it's been posted. Uh, and it will be publicly available, so you will be able to share it uh, with anyone you think should uh, see it and needs to hear the Q&A. Uh, so thank you very much for your questions, and I'll pass it back over to the webinar team. Thanks. Linda, we'll come to you for our next question. When recipient agencies order weekly through the distributor, how does the distrib distributor know the products to apply to the recipient agency prior to the actual orders and end products? So this will depend on the structure of the contract between the distributor and the recipient agency. Moreover, this requirement may require distributors and recipient agencies to change the way they operate. Some examples of how this could work are the recipient agency could alter the lead time for their orders to allow the distributors to order from the processor after receiving the week's orders from the recipient agency. Or another example is that the contract between the distributor and the recipient agency could include authority for the distributor to order products on the recipient agency's behalf for delivery at a later date. In this scenario, in a scenario like this, the distributor could direct the processor to draw down the inventory all at once after one large delivery or according to an interval schedule for each recipient agency. However, under a scenario like this, more responsibility is put on the recipient agency to ensure that they review the full value of their, that they receive the full value of their USDA foods from their distributor. Okay, thanks, Linda. Kylie, we'll come back to you for the next one. Is it expected that schools be asked questions regarding the processor distributed agreements during state, during state administrative reviews? Um, so currently, uh, the processor distributor agreements are not something that's covered in administrative reviews. Um, that would not prohibit a school district from inquiring about the existence of these agreements and the contents of these agreements with their processors and distributors. The existence of the processor distributor agreements will be validated during the third-party audits that processors are required to obtain. Additionally, state distributing agencies could require that the agreements between processors and distributors operating within their state be submitted to the state distributing agency, and they could include those requirements in their state participation agreement with processors. Great. Thank you, Kylie. Linda, we'll come back to you for the next one. What is the time limit requirement for processors to hold on to documentation? Is there a standard that they should follow? So under 7 CFR 250.19a and b, describe the re record keeping requirements in general. State distributing agencies, recipient agencies, and processors are required to retain their rel relevant records for a period of three years from the close of the fiscal or school year to which they pertain. However, records pertaining to claims or audits that remain unresolved in this period of time must be retained until such actions have been resolved. Great. Thank you, Linda. Um, let's see, another question for you, Linda. You mentioned that title, well, or Kylie mentioned that title must be transferred to recipient agencies upon delivery of USDA foods at the distributor. Some states deliver USDA foods to the distributor, then offer them to recipient agencies after they arrive at the distributor. Under this process, they do not belong to a specific recipient agency when delivered. Would this be in violation of the new rule? Linda, do you mind taking this one? Sure. Some states procure end products on behalf of recipient agencies and then have the end products delivered to a distributor for further delivery to the recipient agencies. In these cases, the distributing agency is responsible for competitively procuring con for competitively procured contract 
and title to the USDA foods would transfer to the distributing agency upon delivery to the distributor. The distributing agency would then be responsible for ensuring the recipient agencies receive the value of USDA foods. Thank you, Linda. Kylie, I'll turn to you for the next one. Do the same processor agreements have to be in place for DOD Fresh as for USDA Foods bulk product? Uh, yes. Commercial entities receiving DOD Fresh products from DOD Fresh vendors to process or repackage for recipient agencies would be considered a processor under 7 CFR Part 250 and would therefore be required to comply with all the requirements in this rule, including processing agreements and competitively procured contracts. This is not a change from current rules. Thank you. Um, I think we'll just take one more pause for Sam, and then we are just about to wrap up. All right. Um, so thank you very much for everyone attending. I think we have time for one more question, so we're going to go ahead and do that. And if you have the chance to fill out the surveys uh, before the meeting ends, uh, that would be great. Great. And for our last question today, Kylie, are state administrating agencies going to be required to continue monitoring SFAs and recipient agency processing contracts, or is this oversight now transferred to the third-party audit process? Great. Uh, contracts and other procurement documents between processors and recipient agencies will be reviewed as part of the third-party audit on the processor side, as well as on the procurement review component of the administrator review on the recipient agency side. State agencies will still be required to provide oversight on recipient agency procurements as they, as, they as they have in the past. Thank you so much, Kylie. And um, that's all the questions we're going to be able to take today. Um, we really appreciate everyone's time. I think Sam has some questions left for folks to answer well, about their experience. Actually, it looks like everyone has filled out the questions, so we're going to go ahead and end up for today. Uh, thank you very much for taking the time to I sit here and chat with us and give us feedback. Uh, we really appreciate it. Um, always feel free to reach out to us via email. Um, and we look forward to seeing you at the next webinar.